Hi, everyone. This video is meant to help you understand and provide you with solutions to the homework 12. Homework 12 covers pendulums and oscillatory motion. And I picked a few problems that I felt would be good, hard problems um, to really help you understand um, pendulums and oscillations. So um, I should note the first two problems are on energy and a pendulum, and it takes you through using a simulation. So let's look at that really quick. Um, so here is homework 12, problem 1505. If you click on this simulation, it's gonna give you a simulation of a block moving. Um, and you can change basically, let me make this a little bit bigger. Um, you can change the initial uh, amplitude, how far the block is set away from zero. I believe it tells you to start at four um, meters. And then when you hit um, play, what it's gonna show you on this energy versus time graph is it's gonna show you the net energy, the total energy, uh, mechanical energy at any time. It'll also give you kinetic energy and potential energy. And we know it's gonna start at maximum displacement, which means maximum um, potential energy of a spring. Um, so let's take a look at that really fast. And then we'll go back and, and talk about a few of these things. So if I pause it here, I know that this blue line has to be the potential energy. It started at a maximum displacement, um, x max is equal to four. At that point, it's not moving, therefore it has no kinetic energy, no mv squared over two, because v is zero when it's at maximum displacement. And you can see how it goes through, hits the turning point and comes back and stops. And I should note, that if we go back a little bit, we can see that when it's right here, it's moved from maximum displacement to maximum negative displacement to maximum uh, displacement positive again. That's one period. So this is one full period where it went from all potential to all kinetic, to all potential, to all kinetic, back to all potential. One full period is a little bit over seven seconds you can see here. We can also change this um, to a plot of energy. And here, as we start, we see that the blue is the potential energy of the spring. It's at a maximum here. And then as we go, all kinetic, all potential, all kinetic, all potential, and back and forth. And then there's some questions you need to answer as you go through here um, and we'll answer those kind of quickly. They're not too bad. Um, this first tells you to fill in the type of energy and what color it is. Um, the black line was obviously our mechanical energy, our total energy. The elastic was that blue line and the kinetic was red. Um, now how would we find the spring constant from this information. And I'm gonna actually go back and share my other screen. Um, so let's take a quick look at that. Um, when you have an oscillating um, block like we have, the total energy at any time is a combination of mv squared over two plus kx squared over two. This is the potential energy of the spring. This is the kinetic energy. And we also know that at any time, we found this in the lecture, it's noted in the book, that the total energy has to be the maximum, the maximum amplitude or maximum displacement times k over two. Um, if we look back and see, let's say that we know that this is six joules. Um, 
when you go back and look, you can see that black line is set somewhere. Um, let's say it's six joules. When it is at, um, when x is equal to x max, v is zero. So you can say that at some endpoint, some endpoint where x is equal to x max, then v is equal to zero. And therefore, this part is true. And we know that x max was, let's say, four meters. Um, so we get that k is two times our total energy divided by our maximum displacement squared. And here, this would be two times six is 12 over four squared, which is 16. And that will give me a 0 0.75 Newtons per meter. Um, that's the units of K. You can see these are Newton meters and we're dividing by meters squared. So we get Newtons per meter. Um, that part's easy enough to understand. Um, so if we come back and look, that was question two. Question three is based on the simulation, what best describes the period? I showed you that, I talked about that. It's a little over seven seconds. Question four, for some reason, wants you to look at the plot of energy versus position and redo the colors. And then question five says, if we increase the initial displacement to five meters and run it again, we want to know which is correct for the ratio of the mechanical energy if the amplitude is five meters versus if the amplitude is four meters. And we know from what I just showed you here that the total energy um, at five meters is going to be kx when x is five squared over two, and the energy at four meters is going to be kx at four over two squared. So if I take the ratio between these two, I get that this is x when x is five over when x is four squared, right? Because the k cancel, the two cancel. And that's what this final, um, final question is asking you. It's just five squared over four squared. Um, nothing too hard. I really wanted you to do this problem so that you could play around with it and really understand how the total energy is the energy of the kinetic energy plus the energy of the potential energy. And you could see in real time how those would change and how it would oscillate back and forth. Um, so it's a simple exercise, but there's a few nice things that you can make sure you know from it. All right, so our second interactive problem is the pendulum problem. And this is quite a bit harder than the last one. Um, the simulation of a pendulum, it shows you, um, if I open it a little bit more, it shows you how this pendulum moves. It, you can control the length and the mass. So we can look at how the pendulum moves um, further, if I expand it a little bit more. Um, I can see how the angle changes from a maximum angle to a maximum negative angle and back and forth. However, when you look at this, if you change the length, right, you can see that the angle changes and the period, in fact, does change because the period is from maximum angle to maximum angle. Um, however, if I change the mass, if I play with this and I change the mass, the mass has no effect on the period of a simple pendulum. Um, that's pretty obvious. Another thing I can do is I can click on show the forces. And when I do that, um, what this is showing is it's showing a tension force up and to the left and a weight force down or force of gravity down. And as I go through, you can notice that the force of gravity doesn't change, but the tension does. And there's going to be a few problems where they're asking us at specific points when it's at maximum angle of deflection, is the force of gravity greater than the force of tension? And when it crosses through the center line where the angle is zero, is the tension bigger? And I want to talk about that. Um, so I'm going to close that. Our first question is when 
at time zero, it's at a maximum angle of deflection of 30 degrees. Which of these forces is bigger? Um, so the net force on the bob is zero. That can't be true. It has to have an angular acceleration, making it pulling it back to the left. The tension is larger than the force of gravity, or the force of gravity is larger than the tension, or they're equal. So what we can do to figure this out is we can go back to our other thing. And when the pendulum is here, okay, it has, on a free body diagram, it has a tension here and a weight mg here. And we want to know if these are equal, are they bigger, or are they smaller? Well, they're not equal. You should know that. There is going to be some, um, and this is going to be our initial angle, there's going to be some component of mg, this is also the same, here. So if we assume that mg is our force, so basically what we're having is we have a rotated um, triangle where mg is our hypotenuse. This mg has to be mg cos theta, right? And that has to be equal to the tension. Now, obviously, if theta, unless theta were zero, these two things would have to be equal, right? Therefore, mg has to be greater than our tension. Um, skipping ahead to the next problem so I don't have to change. When I'm at an angle of theta is equal to zero, so I'm straight up and down, the forces are a tension and an mg. And we know that here, there's no force in um, this x direction. The two forces are only in the y. But what are they? And there has to be some ma rad. It's got to point back to the axis of rotation, right? So this is our a rad vector. And that's going to be equal to t minus mg. And t is mg plus ma rad. And whatever velocity this mass has as it's swinging through, a rad will be equal to v squared over whatever the length is. Um, that's just v squared over r. So we can see that as it crosses through the point where the angle is zero, t has to be greater than mg. That's the point of um, what they're getting at in these following questions. So when it's deflected by 30 degrees, the force of gravity has to have a larger magnitude than the tension, um, as I showed you a moment ago. And when the angle is zero, the tension has to be greater than the force of gravity. Okay? Um, it just is by the force diagrams that we drew. All right. So the third question is, what is the work done by these two forces? And you have to remember, that the work is done um, by the displacement of the particle due to the work. Therefore, the tension, because the particle never moves any further than L away from the axis of rotation, the tension isn't doing any work. The force of gravity, the height is changing. So the force of gravity is doing work. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but there's no way the tension can be doing any work because the blob or the bob isn't changing its position with respect to the axis of rotation. Um, okay, so question four says, if we keep the length unchanged but increase the mass, does the period change? We know that the period of a simple pendulum is two pi times the square root of L over G. We know that from our lab. This is basically the question we asked you in lab. If the mass changes, it has no effect on the period. Um, and question five, if the length changes, yes, the period's going to change, going to increase if L increases. Okay, um, let me go back though and come back to this. I'm gonna add one thing here that I wanna talk about. Um, and that is the energy. So 
as our pendulum swings from here to here, right? The force acting here is mg uh, is acting down and there's a tension acting that way or when it gets over here, the tension obviously changes direction. But this tension force is always at the same distance from the axis of rotation. However, the height of the pendulum changes from point one to point two, right? So we need to know what this h is because at point one, it's going to have mg h1, and at point two, it's going to have mg h2. It's actually going to also have mv squared over two, but for now, I just want the change in gravitational potential energy. How do I find h2? So when it's hanging straight down from the axis of rotation, it has a length L. And when it's deflected at some angle, in the problem it was 30, this length is still L. But what we want to know is how high, what is H, okay? And we can see here that this length has to be L cosine of the angle, right? Just think of a triangle with a hypotenuse L and an angle of that. So our h has to be L minus L cosine of theta, or L times one minus cosine of theta, assuming that this length is zero. We'll get the proper length. Um, that'll tell us exactly how high h is. So basically, this thing at energy one, it has mg L times one minus cosine theta, and at energy two, it has mv squared over two. And you could set those two things equal to each other knowing the length and the angle and figure out what the maximum velocity was at zero, let's say. Um, we're gonna do that at one point in one of these problems, but that's super important um, to know um, how to calculate the height of, and I went over that in the lecture when we talked about it really briefly. But that was because I knew we were going to talk about it when we did our homework. Okay, so I hope you find those two simulations useful. Um, more for seeing exactly what's happening with the forces or the energy or whatever. Um, and figuring out what the periods are and on and on. But we also have six other questions that I want to do um, and want to help you with. And these are tough. These are really tough problems, probably tougher than what I will put on the final exam. I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and when you look at the practice exams, you'll see kind of what I'm asking you to do with pendulums and oscillations. But if you understand what's going on here, you'll understand how to do any problems with oscillations and pendulums. So our first problem is 15.5. Uh, and really, this is one of the best um, problems to know for the final. Essentially, what we need to be able to write down is what is x at time t, x max, cosine, omega t, plus v, or minus v, whichever way you want to say it. Um, your book says plus, I'll put plus. But really, we need to figure out what xm is, what omega is, and what phi is. And remember that v of t, if we know all those things, is similarly minus omega xm sine omega t plus phi, and a of t is minus omega squared xm cos omega t plus phi. If you forget, Basically, take the time derivative of x to get v, take the time derivative of v to get a. Um, so really what we need is we need to figure out what omega xm, um, phi, and yeah, and that's it. That's what we need to know. There is one thing that I didn't talk about that I probably should have, but the period is the number of seconds in one oscillation. The number of oscillations in one second is the frequency. And therefore, they are reciprocals of each other. Um, 
since we know that this is 2 pi over our omega, our frequency omega, we get that the period, um, sorry, we get that omega is 2 pi over our frequency. Um, and the reason why I bring that up is here, we're given a frequency. We're told that a blade moves over a total distance of 1.8 millimeters in simple harmonic motion with a frequency of 118 hertz. First thing we wanna know is the amplitude. And so think of it this way. This full distance, right, is 0 0.0018 meters, 1.8 millimeters. Half this distance is our amplitude. This is our negative amplitude. This is our positive amplitude. So our amplitude is simply half of the total. Half of x total is our amplitude. And you can see that that will be what? Um, 5.9, or I'm sorry, 0 0.9 millimeters. So this would be 0 0.0009 meters, right? That is our XM. So from the question, we know that XM is 0 0.0009 meters or nine tenths of a millimeter. Um, from the frequency, we can find omega just by multiplying 2 pi times 118. Um, this, I don't have my calculator with me, but I can do that really fast on my phone. Um, 2 times 3.14 times 118. It's about 741 uh, rad per second, somewhere around there, 741 rad per second, right? So once we know omega is 741 rad per second, and we know the maximum amplitude, we can figure out what is the maximum speed of the blade and what is the maximum acceleration. We don't need phi in this case. Um, the reason why is the maximum value of V and A. So V max occurs when sine of omega T plus V is equal to sine of 90 degrees. Um, since V max is, since V I should say, is X max omega with a negative sine of omega T plus V, we know this is a maximum when this is equal to one, and therefore Vmax magnitude is omega times the amplitude. You can go back and this was 741 and this was 0 0.0009 and you can multiply it out for yourself. Similarly, A max occurs when cos of omega t plus V is equal to cos of zero or cos of 180, either one. Um, therefore, A max uh, is omega squared X max. And so you can just take 741 and square it and multiply it by 0 0.009. Those aren't too hard. Um, essentially, these types of problems and problems you'll see on the final boil down to, can you find the amplitude X max? And can you find omega? Omega is also usually written uh, K over M. Um, remember that this becomes, um, yeah, I believe that's right. I need to make sure that I'm not messing that up. Um, Newtons per meter squared, but that's kilograms meters over seconds squared. Um, if that was meters, uh, yeah, I'm sure that's fine. Um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, hopefully it's right. Um, but uh, so you could figure what this is. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Omega squared should be rads per second squared, which would be Newtons um, per meter squared which would be um, 
I'm sorry, I am being dumb. Um, it would be newtons over meters times kilograms, which would be kilograms and meters over seconds squared divided by kilograms meters, which would give you one over seconds squared. So yeah, it's correct. Um, so if you were given the spring constant K and the mass, you would know omega. If you were given the frequency, you would know omega. There's other ways. If you were given the period, you would know omega. And then finding phi is where the problem usually lies because sometimes you don't do, need to do it mathematically. You know that it, if this is at a maximum value when t is equal to zero, then cosine of phi has to be one. And so you know this is either at zero or if for some weird reason, yeah, it says zero, unless this is a negative, but whatever. Um, we talked about that on the lectures a lot. Um, you'll see it again here. We have a problem here where we need to find phi. But basically the only point here is you need to identify the amplitude XM. You need to identify the, the angular frequency omega, which is different than the frequency. It's the angular speed of the trigonomic function in our position function. And you usually need to find phi. In this case, we don't need phi. We didn't need to worry about it. Um, anyway, moving on. Um, now we have another simple harmonic oscillator. And this one is a block moving um, back and forth, right? Between XM and negative XM on some spring that has a spring constant K. We're told the mass here is two kilograms, and we're told that our spring constant, K, is 360 newtons per meter. And then we're told that when T is 0 0.540 seconds, X of 0 0.54 seconds, so X when T is that, and V when T is this, are given by 0 0.146 meters and 3.730 meters per second. This is exactly like the example problem that is in your book um, that I went over in the lecture video. Um, you'll see what we're gonna need to do with it, but first things first, we need to know what the amplitude of the oscillations are, and then we need to find what the position and velocity of this block are when t is zero, okay? So how we're gonna do that is, first of all, like all these problems, we need to remember that x of t is x max times cosine omega t plus v. And v of t, I'm not gonna put um, the acceleration, we don't need it for this problem but you could put it, okay? <clears throat> so the first thing they want is they wanna know what XM is. The amplitude is XM. So what is XM? And we know, okay, that if we divide V of T by X of T, what we get is we would get minus omega, X max over X max, X max over X max. So that would go away. And then we get sine over cosine, which is tangent of omega T plus V. Okay. Now, um, that doesn't help us to get the maximum amplitude. In order to find the maximum amplitude, what we're going to need to do is something a little bit different. Um, so um, in order to find the maximum amplitude, we're going to find the argument of tangent, plug it in to our x equation, and you'll see what I mean. So um, moving down, we know that x at uh, 0 0.45 or whatever it was, it's xm of cos omega t plus v. 
And as we said, we know that V at 0.405 over X at 0.450 is negative omega tangent of omega T plus V. And from this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to call gamma omega T plus V. Okay. You'll understand why, but this is, if you can do this, you've got this whole problem licked. And then I'm gonna find xm cos of gamma because I know x of that and I'll know cos of that. So if I can solve this for gamma, well, v over x at 0 0.450, 0 0.450 times minus one over omega is tangent of my gamma or gamma, which is, remember, omega t plus v, is arctan of negative v at 0 0.450 over omega x at four point, uh, sorry, at 0 0.450, okay? When you do that, um, you're going to need omega. So can we find omega? Well, yeah, omega is K over M, okay? And K was 360 and M was two. So my omega is square root of K over M, which is 360 divided by two, which is square root of 180. Um, if I do that, hold on one second. do that, I get 13.4 rad per second. All right, so let's move to a new slide. Um, so I have that x at 0 0.450, and if I look back here, that was 0 0.146, 0 0.146 meters. Um, and I have that gamma is arctangent of negative one uh, negative v at 0 0.450 over omega x at 0 0.450 and what i get here is putting in 3.730 divided by um 13.4 times 0.146 and I take uh, the arc tangent of this answer, I get negative 62 times um, pi over 180. I get negative um, 1.08 seven seven rads that's what my gamma is <laughs> okay so now that i have that i can look back at this and i can say that x at 0 0.450 was equal to xm at cosine of gamma or xm is x at 0 0.450 divided by um cos of gamma, remember that you need to be in rads. And what I get here is I get 0 0.146 um, 0 0.146 divided by cosine of negative 1.0877 and I get um, I get that xm here is 0 0.3143 meters, okay? It works out because it better be greater than X 
greater than or equal to x at any time. So how do I find out where x is at time t is equal to zero? Well, in order to do that, remember that x at zero is x m cos of omega times zero plus phi. And now that I have x m, and I know omega, although it doesn't matter because I'm at time zero, I need to find phi. But remember that gamma is equal to omega t plus phi, and when t is equal to uh, one point, or, sorry, um, 0 0.450 seconds, this is equal to negative 1.0877, right? So what I can do here is I can find that negative 1.0877 is equal to omega times point um, four five zero plus phi, or that phi is equal to negative 1.0877 minus um, what was our omega? 13.4 minus 13.4 uh, times 0.45. And what do I get? I get negative 1.0877 minus 13.4 times 0.45. I get negative 7.11. Let's double check that really fast. Um, yeah so um double checking myself um just to make sure i get that b um i get that my fee is equal to negative 7.1177 rad. Um, now remember that that's going to be, so two pi rads. So if I subtract, it's going to be the same as this minus two pi rads or plus two pi rads, but you can leave it alone, it doesn't matter. This is our phase angle, okay? So x, at time zero is x max times cosine times omega t plus phi. If t is equal to zero, this goes away. And what we get is that x at time zero is x max cosine of our phi. Plugging in our values, remember we found 0 0.31, 0 0.3143 times cosine of negative 7.1177. What I would get for that is 0.3413 um, times cosine of negative 7.177. I get point zero point two two nine meters. V at times zero is negative omega xm sine of omega t plus V. And here again, this goes away. So what we really get is we get negative 13.4 times 0.3143 times sine of um, B. So that is 13.4 times 0.3143 times sine of negative 7.1177, all times a negative sign and V is 3.12 meters per second. Okay, it's a lot of work, <clears throat> but basically what you needed to do in steps was to find the amplitude, you had to note that the only way to get it was through here. Um, and so what we did was we solved this equation for the argument of our trig function. Um, we called that gamma. And once we had gamma, we plug gamma into our function to figure out what xm was. 
So basically once we found this, that's pretty hard to do. And then we found phi and basically we needed phi to plug into our X naught and our V naught equations in order to find what they were if we knew XM and we knew omega. It's a tough question. Um, go through it a couple times, make sure you get it, you understand it. It's not easy though, okay? Um, yeah. All right, so now this problem is really about energy in simple harmonic motion. And this is really, really, really an easy question that you can almost answer without doing too much math. We know that the total energy is equal to k x m squared over two. But at any point, it's equal to m v squared over two plus k x squared over two. And what this is asking you is, when the displacement x is one sixth of x m, what fraction of the total energy is each of these? Well, you know that whatever fraction this one is, this has to be one minus whatever fraction that is. So let's just find one of them and then we'll automatically have the other. I'm gonna start with kx because I know x is xm divided by six, okay? Now I also know that um, if I divide this, so if I divide kx squared over two by the total energy, kxm squared over two, this will give me the fraction of kinetic energy over energy total, right? And you can see these cancel. And what you really get is you get xm over six squared over xm squared, which is simply 136, right? The xm squared cancel. So if I know that the total energy is 100, right, it's one over one, but if I know that one 36th of this is potential energy, then this has to be 35, 36. Easy enough, right? Um, we could figure that out. I don't want to, I just want to do this. <laughs> then again, um, that's answer, this is answer, a, this is answer B. Um, at what displacement, in terms of the amplitude, is the energy of the system half kinetic and half potential? So if kx max squared over two is equal to kx squared over two plus mv squared over two, but we wanna know when each of these is equal to one half kxm squared over two, and when this is equal to one half kxm squared over two, we want to know the, the displacement, so we might as well just use this part. So when kx squared over two is equal to one half kxm squared over two, we're going to solve this for x, a k and a half cancel, and what we get is that x is equal to the square root of xm squared over two, or xm over square root of two, and that's your answer. When the displacement is the maximum amplitude divided by the square root of two, half the energy is stored in the potential energy and half the energy is the kinetic energy. This question is all about just understanding the relationship between kinetic energy and potential energy in simple harmonic motion. All right, moving on. Um, this is a physical pendulum problem. We know that because it's a thin uniform rod swinging about an axis through one end. And if we look back on the problems we did and in the book, we know the period of a physical pendulum is uh, two thirds L over G. This is because it's actually I over MG R to the um, radius of, of um, basically the radius of gyration. And here we know that if the whole rod is L this distance to where the weight force is being applied, which is what R is. So R is the distance to where the weight is being applied, the center of mass 
from the axis to the center of mass. And I for a rod is ML squared over three if it's rotating about one end. And that gave us two pi. Um, ML squared over three M G L to the half, which as I already said was uh, two thirds L over G, right? Okay, so we know the period here. Um, it tells us that the rod has a period of 1.6 seconds and an angular amplitude of 3.9 degrees. What that means is that if we assume at maximum distance from the center line, the maximum angle is 3.9 degrees. Um, that's not too tough. So first let's find, if we know the period is this, um, I wanna solve this for um, Um, I want to set this for um, to solve for L. So I can see that I can multiply everything or square everything. Um, and um, sorry. Uh, Uh, so if I square everything, I get t squared is four pi squared L over G times two thirds, right? Solving this for G or for L, I get that L is t squared um, times three G all divided by eight pi squared, okay? That's not too hard to do. Plug in for G 9.81, plug in for T, 1.6 seconds. Um, the next thing we wanna know is what is, the, what is the maximum kinetic energy of the rod as it swings? And this is a little bit harder. This is actually a much tougher question. So what did I just say? I just said that L was T squared times three times G over eight pi squared. Um, but what we want to know is what is V max? Okay. So let's think about this for a minute. When it's at its maximum angle, right? It's also at H max. And when it's at H is equal to zero, let's say, it's at V max. So as it passes through this center line, it's going to be, um, exchanging potential energy for kinetic back to potential and back and forth, right? So um, we wanna know the maximum kinetic energy, but the kinetic energy max has to be equal to the potential energy max. And therefore, if we can find this, which might be easier than finding this because this is mv squared over two and this is mgh max. Um, Whichever one we can find is the answer. This occurs when it's at maximum um, angle. This occurs when it's at an angle of zero and when the potential energy all becomes kinetic. Okay, so what is H? And as we already said, right, we know that H here, that this whole length is L and this is L cos theta right? So we know that H here has to be equal to L times one minus cos theta maximum. Um, okay. If we do that, what we get, um, we were given the mass is 0.5 kilograms. What we get is mg L times one minus cos max. Um, there's other ways we could have solved for this. One thing we could have done um, is we could have found V and commuted it, uh, computed it with V. And um, remember that V is basically omega times 
theta max. Um, actually, I shouldn't say that. What V is, is actually omega x max. But this, doing this, you would have to compute that x max is L over theta max, right? And what you get is that V is um, basically, um, V, I'm checking on something, hold on. Um, I want to make sure I don't tell you something weird if Wiley plus wants something different. Um, nope. Um, Wiley plus actually does it the way I did it right here. So this is the potential energy max, but that's equal to the kinetic energy max. And you found L in the first step of this problem. And they gave you theta max was 3.9 degrees, whatever they gave you, and they gave you M and you have G. So again, just make sure you understand that. You're all good. Okay. All right. Um, I was actually thinking of a different problem that we're going to do, the very last problem that we're going to do, and I was being weird. Sorry. Um, this problem is a really, really kind of weird problem that's um, exploring a little bit about damped oscillators. So I wanted you to have a chance to actually do some stuff with a damped oscillator. Um, they're not too bad, but they're a little bit more math that we didn't talk about. So we're gonna talk about it here. You probably don't need to worry about, well, you don't need to worry about damped oscillators for the final, but make sure you understand it because it applies to all systems. You're going to see a lot of damped systems. You may not realize that's what you're seeing, but you're seeing damped systems in biology and chemistry and whatever else. Um, so, all right, so let's talk about this problem. The damped simple harmonic oscillator has a mass of 1.9 kilograms and a spring constant of 11 newtons per meter. And it says that this damping force is going to be given by beta is 330 grams per second. Um, we're going to change this to uh, kilograms. There's a thousand grams in a kilogram, so this is 0 0.330 kilograms per second, just to start off with. And the block is pulled down 18.1 centimeters, which is um, the initial, okay, the initial amplitude is 18.1 meters. Um, one centimeters, which is 0.181. Okay, so they want us to then calculate the time required for the amplitude of the resulting oscillation to fall to one half of its initial value. Yikes. We know that this oscillation looks like this. Okay, if we do time and x, Starting at x max, it starts doing this, right? But remember that I told you that the amplitude is actually described by e to the minus beta t over 2m. This function describes our amplitude over time. This is actually our cosine of omega prime t plus whatever our initial thing is. And therefore what we got was we got that x at any time was x max times e to the minus beta t over 2m. This was our amplitude part. This was our periodic um, oscillation part. So if we want to know the time required for the oscillations to fall to half of the initial value, then what we're saying is we need this to be x initial divided by two. And that occurs at a time of x initial times e to the minus beta t over 2m. Okay, I hope that makes sense to you. Another way to say this is that occurs when one half is equal to e 
to the minus beta t over 2m. Now, um, because if we cancel these, so now what happens is, um, Um, you might have a different, it, it might be a third or it might be um, an eighth or something. I got a half on this one. Okay, so how do we deal with an exponential? We multiply both sides by ln. That brings this down. We get ln, ln of one half is equal to negative bt over 2m. But ln of 1 half, ln of a over b, um, is equal to ln of a minus ln of b, just so you know. And ln of 1 is 0. So this ends up being negative ln of 1, uh, sorry, positive minus ln of 2 is equal to negative bt over 2m. And this is 0, negative sign go away. We get that ln of 2 is bt over 2m, or t is 2m times ln of 2 divided by b. And we were given m. We were given b, although they gave it to you in grams. Um, change it to kilograms. And we can plug in ln of 2. Um, if I do that in my calculator, I get uh, 1.9, uh, 0.330, 0 0.9 times 2 times ln um, of 2 divided by 0 0.330. I get 7.98 seconds. 7.98 seconds. Okay. And now, um, the last thing that they're going to ask is how many oscillations happened in this time? And this is a little bit tricky because we know that the time is 7.98 seconds. The number of oscillations that occurred, okay, the period of one oscillation is 2 pi over omega prime. For a damped oscillator, omega prime is k over m minus b squared over 4m squared, right? Um, so um, basically, if we want to find t, we just take 2 pi over this. Um, this, if I do it, I get uh, what was our k? Our k was 11. Our mass was 1.9 minus uh, 0 0.330 times 0 0.330 divided by 4 times um, our mass squared. And take the square root of this answer. I get that this is 2.4. Okay. So all this stuff here, this is 2 pi over 2.4. So 2 times pi divided by 2.4, I get 2.6. 2 2.618. Okay. So I need to take the time, and this is. The period, remember, is the seconds per oscillation. I want to know the number of oscillations. So t over t gives me seconds over seconds per oscillation gives me the number of oscillations. And that is 7.98 divided by 2.618, or um, about 3.05 oscillations, okay? That's a little bit confusing, I know, but this is the period, the time for one oscillation. This is the total time it took to get to half
the amplitude. So the total time it took to fall to x to the half, right? Because this is the part that controls the amplitude, you only need to set um, this part of the equation to half of x amp. And from there, you get your answer. Um, it's not too bad once you've done it a few times, but um, it's a bit of a pain, um, to be honest. Um, I also hate questions where they give you too much information. They gave you that the block was pulled down 18.1, but you don't need to know that. Anyway, um, a little bit of stuff on exponentials and logs you may not know. Make sure you know that stuff. Um, and then this is just dividing the total time by the time per period to get the number of periods. Our final problem is a pendulum that we're given the displacement as a oscillatory motion equation. So we're given this as an oscillation, um, but it's still just a simple pendulum. And what it's telling us is how omega varies with t. So remember that x of t is x max, times cos times omega t plus b. This is saying that if I'm in angle, then this is omega t plus b. And we want to know what the length of the pendulum is and what its maximum kinetic energy is. Well, we know that omega, right, is essentially one over the period, right? Um, it's actually two pi over the period. And the period of a simple pendulum is two pi L over G. And therefore, this is equivalent to two pi L over G or G over L. We already knew that, but just to go back. Therefore, L is equal to omega squared divided by G. Uh, sorry. Um, L is G over omega squared. Square both sides, L omega. What is omega? Well, we can identify right here that our omega is whatever's in front of T. This is our omega. So this is just G over 7.5 squared. And you can get L. That's not too bad. The maximum kinetic energy, again, you would need to figure out how does what is mgh or what is when the angle is equal to zero what do we have now remember that since this is theta is theta max times cos omega t plus v and v max which we call omega uh circular let me i'm going to do it this way I'm going to call it this. This is the velocity of this angle is with a negative sign times sine of omega t plus v, right? But we know that when this is a maximum, this is all zero, right? Further, so this is omega times theta max. Further, though, we want actually to know v, okay? So that's not helpful. What is helpful is noting that just like when we have our um, rolling without slipping, we can use that to find the maximum amplitude, okay? If this is L and this is some angle, then this is L times the angle, right? Therefore, what we get is that V is actually um, going to be omega times this distance. Further, we know that the maximum kinetic energy happens when this is a max and this is a max when we have this. So we would get m to the half times omega squared times l squared 
times the angle squared. Um, and that uh, is going to give us, if we look back here, it's a 73 gram bob. So that's a 0 0.073 kilogram mass. We know omega is point, um, 7.5. We found the length here. Our length was g over omega squared. Um, and we were told our maximum angle was 0 0.0042 rads. Um, was that what it was? Yep. And plugging all those numbers in will give us the maximum kinetic energy. Um, if I do that for you, I get 0.073 times 0.5 times 7.5 times 7.5 times, um, oh, actually, since that's g over omega squared, um, let me compute that really fast. Is point one seven so I get um, point oh seven three times point five times seven point five times seven point five times point one seven four four times point one seven four four times point oh four two times point oh four two and I get one point one times 10 to the minus four joules. Um, and that's pretty close to what the answer is in y the plus. So, okay. Um, what you might not have realized was how to find this as the maximum velocity. How do you turn this into this? Um, and Essentially, what it is, is that remember that r omega is v, or r theta is, I'm sorry, um, v is r omega, right? So v is l omega, right? Um, so where does this other omega come in? Um, because that's not exactly, uh, I'm being dumb, sorry. Um, V is R omega and X is, uh, R theta, right? Okay. So if we have V is omega times X, right? And Really, in X, this is L theta. You can see that we can plug in um, or X max. This occurs at that. I hope that makes sense to you. Um, that's one way to see it. This is the other way. Um, but that gives you the maximum velocity. And then you need to turn that into kinetic energy because actually it asks for the kinetic energy. Um, I guess the other way you could find it is you could say that this is essentially um, L omega, right? V is L omega. And then you will get that there, right? And taking the, the, the magnitude of that value, um, which is fine. You could do it that way too. But anyway, uh, Hopefully these problems help you. They are hard. I know they're hard. They're meant to be hard so that the exam's easy. Um, but hopefully they're helpful. And I'm probably not going to post a video about the practice final solutions. I'll just throw them online. Um, anyway, so this will be our last video. Uh, hope you enjoyed our course. And I hope you have success in everything you do from here forward.
Thanks for watching, LDs.